Welcome, everybody. This is the 37th episode of the Clemens Bookworm, and we're really thrilled to have you with us today. I am Angela Unk, Director of Development at the Clemens Library. I just want to note that today's meeting will be recorded to share online. This afternoon, you'll receive an email with the recording and any resources mentioned in today's broadcast. Just in case you're joining us for the first time, I want to tell you a little bit about how we use Zoom. Please go ahead and chime in in the chat. Uh, you know, if you change the setting to everyone, we can keep the conversation going. However, you'll see that it goes by very quickly. So if you have questions, please put those in the Q&A section. Um, in the Q&A section, you can also give a thumbs up, which will upvote a question if it's one that you have as well. That just helps prioritize what we get to after the presentation. We do, as part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion program, have the live machine captions on today. So you can toggle those on or off by going to the live transcript button. You can also change the size and adjust as you need to. I have side-by-side -side mode enabled today. I can still only control so much of what you see, but take some time to play around with that. Uh, you can move the separator to change the relative size of the slides versus the speaker. This program is brought to you by the William L. Clements Library, located on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The Clements Library enables the discovery, learning, and teaching of American history through the collection, conservation, digitization, and sharing of primary sources on paper. I'd like to take a moment to put us in context and think about the place, at least where the Clements Library is located. The University of Michigan is located on the territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations made the largest single land donation to the University of Michigan, offered ceremonially as a gift in the text of the treaty at the foot of the rapids, so that their children could be educated in a Western manner. We acknowledge the history of native displacement that allowed the University of Michigan to be founded. Today, we reaffirm the contemporary and ancestral Anishinaabek ties to this land and their profound contributions to this institution. The William L. Clements Library acknowledges that it has and continues to benefit from the original land dispossession and established hierarchies of settler colonialism. Let's take just a moment to look at the poll question. I appreciate everyone who um, uh, took, a, took a guess at this and I will share the results now. So our poll question is how many Native American boarding schools have there been in the United States? And the answer, according to the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, is that there were 367 Indian boarding schools. And um, you'll find out from Veronica, of course, that some of these are still in operation. So, um, and that we might discover more uh, as research continues. Today's episode has been generously sponsored by the Alumni Association of the University of Michigan. Thank you so much for your partnership in this program and welcome to anyone who is joining us for the first time because you saw it advertised through the Alumni Association. We're glad you're here. Oops, sorry. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce um, 
Veronica Passfield to the bookworm today. And she earned her PhD at the University of Michigan in American Studies with a specialty in Native American Studies. Veronica is a journalist, editor, and tribal consultant who assists tribes and museums with exhibitions and other projects that center and showcase Native knowledge. She serves as an AGPRA officer for her tribe, the Bay Mills Indian Community. Today, she'll share with us her research for a book she is currently working on about the founding ideologies of federal Indian boarding schools. So Veronica, I'm so pleased to welcome you today. I'm so pleased to be here with you. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. Go blue. Go blue indeed. <laughs> And by the way, miigwech to the Alumni Association. They gave me my first scholarship in the 80s when um, I was an undergrad and I used their scholarship to buy my books. So I love them. And my dear friend, Rick Ratner, who I'm sure is not on this call, but he helped me get there. So if anybody's friends with Rick, we have a friend in common. Oh, thank you. Lovely. So when did you first begin researching Native American boarding schools? You know, what's funny is um, I did not even know about them growing up. We were one of the families, and this is pretty common in Indian country, where our elders did not speak of their experiences. And when I finally started to learn about it, when my son was like preschool kindergarten, so that was back in the late 90s, I was absolutely captivated, taken, devastated, heartbroken, everything, all the feelings came up. So I started then and um, my grandma was already gone. Um, but I think one of the reasons I really started, why I cared about it so much is it explained so much mm -hmm. about so many of the dynamics in my family and in my tribe and tribal communities generally. Yes, yes. You and I talked a little bit about that as we were setting this program up because you know, my great grandmother was also at Mount Pleasant um, Industrial Indian Boarding School, and it was a thread in my family that was sort of talked about, but in a, a complicated way, you know, where, where, you know, there'd be a sentence about, well, she was sent to a school and then never moved back to the reservation, you know, type of thing where it wasn't until, you know, I was an adult that I fully understood the implications of that as well. Yeah. Very so. And it's funny because, I mean, I think there's still stories that um, I haven't shared with my son. I mean, so I'm kind of living it too, where it's like, you know, there's some stories that you don't even know how to tell them, or you don't want to hurt the people that you tell them to. So. Right, right. And they're not even um, my story, so I can't imagine what it was like for, for them, for the students. Exactly. Now, I know that, um, that as you became interested, then you proposed it as a PhD thesis, right? So well, what happened? I love this story so much. So I came into Michigan um, to do an MFA in poetry. So my master's thesis was um, a collection of poems about boarding school. Um, have the same kind of sort of, um, you know, uh, kind of trickiness about do I write poems that tell the stories that I've heard that have been shared with me that I've read, you know, about this just absolute savagery, but also, you know, these incredibly noble and, and courageous stories as well. So how far do I go? And then I took a class um, while I was in that program in the Department of English um, that was race and narrative. And I was a goner again. And so I was encouraged by some really great faculty at Michigan in Native Studies. And I have to say, like Phil Deloria stands out in my mind the most, and Vince Diaz, who's now um, at Minnesota, they said, apply for the PhD. You know, it's, you, can, you can have your PhD in five years and it's funded and da 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 da. Well, you know, 10 years later, <laughs> a lot happened. Everybody was sick of me, but, uh, it, it, was a, it was a big topic. So one of my very favorite faculty members and one of the most incredible human beings I've ever known who just won the National Book Award, Taya Miles, 
um, I just, whatever time I think of her, I just feel warm inside because she's so incredible. So she, in a, in a protective way said, you know, I don't, I don't really know if you should do your dissertation on boarding school. That topic is really played out. Little did any of us know, you know, I, that there was so much more. I mean, I kind of knew because I was very connected to community. And I think by the way, this is my plug for Michigan all the units at Michigan, departments at Michigan, faculty at Michigan, certainly anybody working with Indian people, you must be connected to community and you must let your community drive, you must let communities drive the work. We know what we need, we know what we, we care about. Let us, let us lead you. So I think that um, I felt affirmed in that way. Right. And certainly in this moment, we, we, we can see that there's lots more to say, and I'm sure Ty would be the first one to agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think we haven't told all the stories. Yeah. So we will. we're going to keep trying. Right. Well, um, I'm going to turn it over to you to okay. share your screen and just tell us a lot more about your research. Okay, guys. Let's see. Oops, I, I need to be given permission. All right, there you go. You should have it now. Oh, cool. You can see my messy desktop. And then I'm going to do presenter view. So somebody chime in if you don't if you don't like this view. Does that view look okay? Is it full screen? It is not full screen. We're seeing um, the next slide in addition to the current slide. Slideshow. There, there we go. That's better. Okay, cool. All right. So um, the thing I wanted to talk about today, and I really uh, appreciate, as I was telling Angela, the opportunity to share some of my findings with you, um, because it was a challenge for me to try to sort of boil down um, my research into a few key points. So um, the, the part of, of, of what I'm looking at that I wanted to talk about today was how boarding schools are, were actually used as tools of empire and that I'm very interested in evolving the narrative of boarding schools from the sort of received narrative of Richard Pratt, the founder of Carlisle, was an evil evildoer that these schools uh, were uh, focused on assimilation um, and that, you know, the, these are stories of trauma. Obviously, I would never say that we have to move beyond the trauma. We, we don't. Okay, so this is my family. And these people are the some of the some of the key people that got me interested in this work. So what who you see here um, are Jim and Anna, James and Anna Brown Smith. So James is in the middle, obviously the dad. And then Anna Brown Smith is the woman on the far left with her hands clasped in the white shirt. She does not look very happy there. She is pregnant. I have often wondered if she was just really feeling morning sick or something, but she's pregnant there with twins. And um, my great grandfather is the little boy at his dad's left, um, left hip. That's Jimmy Smith, my great grandpa. And um, across from him is his sister, Lucy Smith LeBlanc. And the historic photos from my family come from her and her descendants at Bay Mills Indian Community, the Ojibwe um, History Department. My dissertation, um, which I finished in 2013, like we're talking about, oh my God, it seems like yesterday and it's like seven years or eight years. Um, but I, where my research led me was um, at looking at the Trans-Pacific and nation building creation story of the Federal Indian Boarding School. Now, I really benefited from the very rich um, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary moment in Native Studies in the program in American culture. I'm sure I would have never thought about Hawaii were it not for Vince Diaz, who was on my committee, and, and there are others. So, so um, that's, this is my uncle, Walter. He was in that last picture. Um, this is his Mount Pleasant um, Indian boarding school photo, and I think it's around 1911. Oh, there's so much in this picture. I swear I have to blow it up to, you know, the size of my couch and, and put it on my wall. 
um, I, when I looked at this, I thought with, after everything that we had been through, the treaties, the virgin soil epidemics, et cetera, why were they militarizing children? Like why go to the trouble of creating little soldier uniforms for Indian kids? Like how about like just give us normal clothes and really good food to eat and really good books. And then I know from the story of my own family, I'm just gonna go back. Um, a couple of months after this, or several months after this photo was taken, Anna Brown Smith um, delivered her and James's twins. Um, it was winter, it was January, and um, unfortunately, um, she and her twins died in childbirth. And at the time, James's um, femur was broken. So it was a, a, a catastrophe on many levels. And the last and probably uh, one of the biggest tragedies was that the Indian agent took that opportunity of the death of Anna and the, and the babies to come in and um, kidnap the Smith children and send them off to Mount Pleasant Indian School. Their oldest stepsister, who's on the other side, had already gone to Mount Pleasant, but James did not want his children to go there. He was a head man in our tribe, very well respected. He, there was no reason to take his children and the community tried to rally to um, you know, take in the kids while, hit, while James's leg healed, et cetera, and the Indian agent was having none of it. So I often wondered, why, why would you kidnap children? And I knew from learning about my own family that, that, we had, that these children had run away from school. So they're here, they're in the early 1900s, cars didn't even exist. They're in Mount Pleasant trying to get back to Brimley, Michigan. I, I can't even imagine what that was like as a child in that era. So those are my kind of main questions that drove my work. Um, I think, as I said, that we need to move beyond the received narratives. Um, and I think it's, I just really wanna take this moment to acknowledge that boarding schools have been devastating for survivors, for families, for Indian communities, for um, indigenous cultures. Um, in fact, I was just on the consultations this week with the Department of the Interior um, for uh, Secretary Deb Holland's new uh, boarding school truth initiative where they're trying to do some truth telling, including trying to find the unmarked graves of the children in the um, American Indian boarding schools. Um, we know that there are, that there are children who uh, were murdered at Mount Pleasant. I've heard uh, eyewitness accounts. And we know from the survivors that children were put into unmarked graves um, outside of the school cemetery. So um, the Saginaw Chippewa tribe has done incredible work um, with that facility and with that cause. So here's a, I'm gonna just kind of line up the three misconceptions that I'm gonna briefly touch on and talk to you guys about today. I just wanna kind of inform your thinking. We've had a lot of media coverage about boarding school, um, which, is, which is great, uh, but we're kind of recycling a received narrative that really uh, uh, journalists really need to dig in a little bit more. And I think it really kind of uh, sparked me to get a book proposal going. So here's the, one of the first misconceptions that Indian boarding schools started with Carlisle Indian School in 1879. That's a misconception. Here is a picture from Carlisle of all these little darlings who went to school there. By the way, my, my great grandfather was four when he was sent. Another misconception that um, Carlisle founder Richard Henry Pratt was the mastermind, an evildoer and a mastermind of this nefarious project. I'm not saying I like the guy. I'm just saying that's simplistic. And the third misconception I wanna quickly talk about, I don't know why some of my pictures are pixelating by the way, they looked, anyway, we'll go on. But um, that another misconception, the third misconception that I wanna talk about is that assimilation was the primary goal of the schools. This one is bugging me the most because um, it, 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 it so limits the actual work of the schools. Okay, so as Angela was telling us, there are 367 Indian boarding schools in the United States all over the country. You can kind of see a rundown here. Um, if somebody thinks of it, you can put a link in the chat to this um, graphic. This graphic was compiled and created by the, Net by the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, as Angela mentioned. 
and um, this PDF they created for people to use in any way that they want. So this is, you know, a, a great resource for anybody who wants to talk about this in their life, their, their classroom, et cetera. Okay, so I want to apologize to you guys because some of these photos actually are quite old. They don't necessarily have sources and they're not of the greatest quality, but um, it's the best that, that exists. So the creation story of Federal Indian Boarding Schools doesn't begin with Carlisle, but it begins in missionary schools and is rooted in land theft in Hawaii beginning in the early 1830s. This picture is from Hilo um, Boarding School, um, which opened in 1835 um, in Hilo on the island of Maui. And it was started by this lovely gentleman. His name is Richard Armstrong. And according to the missionaries in Hawaii at that time, they represented several different missionary organizations. But according to Richard, the schools were critically important for the success of settler missions and also for the success of the industries that they started once they decided to give up their mission and become industrialists. So this is Richard Armstrong. He was a missionary for the American Board of Commissioners of Foreign Missions. He was known as the father of Hawaiian education. Um, he created industrial schools for Kanaka Mali across the Hawaiian Islands. These schools pressured Hawaiian people to abandon their language, religion, and culture, and to become wage laborers in an increasingly settler-driven economy. Through unethical means, missionaries became major land and plantation owners in Hawaii, i.e. the Dole family, another uh, family of missionaries. Um, I think we all know the name from pineapples. Um, Richard bought 3,300 acres on Maui for a pittance um, for what one Hawaiian scholar um, estimated was 20% of its market value at the time and started Haiku Sugar Mill Plantation. He's just one of many. Um, and after a, life, a lifetime of work, he spent his whole entire uh, adulthood in um, Hawaii creating these schools and trying to um, convert religiously and culturally Kanaka Mali people. What he, before he died in 1860, he declared that his, really his life's work had been a failure, um, that he had not solved the quote, structural problem of Kanaka culture. So his son, Samuel Chapman Armstrong, leaves Hawaii to go to college in the States. The Civil War breaks out. He fights uh, nobly. He um, earns a reputation for himself as being you know, a leader. And um, he was stationed in Hampton, Virginia. Uh, when Hampton was declared, was you know, taken over by the Union and declared a, a safe haven for slaves if they could, enslaved people if they could get there. And he established the Hampton Normal Institute for Freedmen on ABC FM owned land in 1868. You see a photo credit there. If you ever are interested in some really fascinating photography, Francis Benjamin Johnston, um, her collection from Hampton is, is really, really fascinating. And I drew kind of heavily from that in this presentation. So let me see. Okay, so one of the most fascinating things to me about Hampton is that it sparked a debate between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, Booker T. Washington bought into Samuel Chapman Armstrong's idea that, um, that African-Americans would need generations to join fully the humanity and uh, be, you know, human people uh, and citizens. And W. E. And this school was great to help him do that. Of course, Booker T. Washington went on to found um, Tuskegee. W. E. B. Du Bois did not agree. Um, and his classic line, uh, and I don't know if this is the exact quote, but basically uh, what he said to Booker T. was, "You're trying to tell me that they created a a school to teach enslaved people how to work." So it's a big, there's a big tension in this moment in America after the Civil War. So here is a quote from Samuel Chapman Armstrong kind of um, touting the, you know, his, his identity and life experience 
as somebody who created schools for BIPOC people. It meant something to the Hampton School and perhaps to the ex-slaves of America that from 1820 to 1860, the distinctly, distinctively missionary period, there was worked out in the Hawaiian Islands the problem of the emancipation, enfranchisement, and Christian civilization of a dark-skinned Polynesian people in many respects like the Negro race. So this is where uh, he situates himself. I'm, I'm guessing that you can see, you know, some similarities with, with um, the sort of founding ideas for Carlisle, a generation later. Okay, I'm gonna, it's gonna feel like I'm jumping around a little bit here because I only have a few, you know, a limited amount of time, but just stay with me here because there's lots of pieces that kind of come together. So this photograph absolutely haunts me like the photograph of my uncle, great uncle Walter um, knitting out of his military hat. Um, this is a history class that was taught at Hampton. Um, and I find it fascinating that here in this classroom, there are African American students and Native American students. And I'm very interested in the way that there is a separation happening for especially the Native students who are there in their school clothes, their Euro American clothes, looking in, at the sort of exoticized um, image of, of their fellow indigenous person. And so we're gonna get at that a little bit, but just hang with me here and that's kind of where we're headed and why that, why that matters. Um, I was really lucky at Michigan. I mean, one of the great things about going to Michigan is that you have scholars, some of the most important scholars from all over the world who come. So uh, I was lucky to be at Michigan when John Osorio came he does incredible work, read everything of his that you possibly can. And the framing of his work, I really took a lot of inspiration from as well. And the, I'm gonna tell you ahead of time that the word mo'olelo means is a concept of story that exists in Kanakamali culture. And it has to do, it's very complex, but it's basically a story that is never done, that is never complete. So John Osorio said, this is a new mo'olelo, one that has never been told in quite this way before. It is a story of how colonialism worked in Hawaii, not through the naked seizure of land and governments, but through a slow insinuating invasion of people, ideas, and institutions. That's the kind of story that, I, that really interests me. All right, so we're gonna go back in time a little bit. It's all gonna come together at the end with that photo I showed you of the teaching American history um, at Hampton. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is decenter Pratt and it's really easy to do. Pratt, um, into this sort of multi-generational classist, white supremacist story of the Armstrong family, started in Pennsylvania, went to Hawaii, came back, son comes back and starts a school at Hampton in 1868. Um, into this story arrives a non-remarkable army officer, Richard Henry Pratt, not, not terribly special, not heroic, um, in 1875, Pratt was stationed in Indian Territory, now Oklahoma, and was assigned to guard 72 warriors from several tribes in Indian Territory. Most of these men had surrendered, and one woman had sur surrendered to the army to stop its unceasing violence against tribal families during the Buffalo War, some call it the Red River War. Um, this war spread across um, what is now the state of Oklahoma, and it was really one of the last stands against um, more widespread um, Euro-American and American in incursion into the, this last stronghold for some of these um, Southern Plains tribes. Um, the warriors, uh, the army kind of ran them down relentlessly and the warriors surrendered um, to stop the, these attacks on their families. The War Department didn't quite know what to do with these warriors, that can they convict them? They're not citizens are, you know, what is the status of Indian people within, you know, the American body politic in 1875? It wasn't clear. So the War Department decided to exile these POWs to Florida's Fort Marion, which is in St. Augustine, Florida. It's an old Spanish fort. And they assigned Pratt to escort these POWs from Indian territory um, across the country on, you know, planes, trains, and automobiles. They were on river ships and railroads, et cetera, um, horse and buggy wagons and 
um, Pratt's job was to oversee their imprisonment at Fort Marion. Um, Pratt got really sick of watching people die in dank Florida um, cells in June. Um, so he did what he knew, which was to cut their hair, cut the warrior's hair. He dressed them up in old army uniforms, gave them decommissioned guns and taught them these highly skilled equestrian uh, warriors who were part of very incredibly developed warrior societies. He taught them to march and to quote, be men. We know this part, this part's pretty well established. What Pratt was not counting on was the, was the incredible spirit of these um, indigenous people. Um, and they, one of the things that he did that he really could not control was that he um, gave them paper and pencil and they started drawing pictures at the fort in imprisonment of their culture, of themselves, of their families. Here, I believe is a warrior society um, ceremony. Um, this image came from the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum. I co-curated a show um, at the Commerce Art Museum in Jacksonville with um, a Cheyenne curator about these drawings. It is the first time that we know of that a Cheyenne person was invited to interpret in an official capacity in a museum exhibit the drawings of his grandparents and relatives who were imprisoned at Fort Marion. So we're getting there guys, it's just taken a while. So another way that we really need to decenter Pratt is that um, schooling Indians was not Pratt's idea at all. At Fort Marion, Pratt granted the request of nearby missionary women who were running freedmen schools in St. Augustine, Florida. And they wanted to set up a classroom at the fort in one of the cells to quote, see if Indians can learn. Okay, Harriet Beecher Stowe was one of the women who was there in St. Augustine. And she was one of the women who pressured Pratt to see if he would allow um, his sort of pantomime soldiers to uh, instead become their stu students. And the idea absolutely captivated the nation. This is a tear sheet from Harper's Weekly. Okay. So this is again a uh, commencement um, address for, for Hampton. So Hampton is always in the background, right? Um, sorry, I almost skipped a part. So when they were done with, so these um, POWs arrived at Fort Marion in 1875. Um, in 1878, the War Department says, okay, we're done. Clearly these are not dangerous warriors anymore. And uh, you can either go home or Pratt and, and the ladies in St. Augustine arranged for the younger men who wanted to, to go to school at Hampton. Um, and that's where we get, you know, back to where they, you have African American and American Indian students together at Hampton. So to me, this is the best quote I've ever seen about why it matters that, and why they were willing to accept Indian students at Hampton. When a North American savage ceases to yearn for other people's hair or scalps and begins to produce tin dust pans, right? vocational education, this is one of the things that they learned. It really looks as if civilization had gotten a reasonably secure preliminary grip upon the race. It cost $20,000 to kill an Indian, right, in war, but to turn the Kiowa orator of today from a dangerous savage into a civilized Christian cost only $1,000 tuition at Hampton. Shall we kill them or civilize them? So this is sort of the bargain moving forward, but this was not Pratt's idea. This was the idea of missionary women in Florida. Okay, so again, mo'olelo, gotta think of waves. We're gonna go back and forth in time. So why, all right, so we're gonna get to another idea. Sorry, you guys. It was really hard for me, I have to tell you, to figure out how to transition into these different things that I want to talk to you about. So this still doesn't answer for me this idea of captivity. Yes, grown men who are warriors who are taken captive. Okay, why take children captive? What's that about? So what happened in um, Indian ter territory right after the Civil War is that the army was not successful in completely conquering tribes, right? So 
there was a lot of drama about this, a lot of bloodshed on all sides because this uh, could not be resolutely accomplished. So General Phil Philip Sheridan, the little dude, uh, second from left, um, was put in charge of the um, Western territories. And he ordered the, um, his troops in Oklahoma, ter in Indian territory to enact total war tactics. Um, he had done this in the Shenandoah Valley during the Civil War, burning everything, burning, making it inhabitable for, uh, for life in those areas. He pulls Custer off of disciplinary leave. Do you recognize Custer here on the far right? Um, to enact a historic winter campaign against tribes. This is in 1868, right? So I'm trying to understand this captivity piece that happened in my family and so many other families. Why is this going on? Well, Sheridan decides that we are going to make these tribes submit by any means necessary. So in 1868, he orders Custer to go in and basically any native person who was not on a reservation was fair game to be shot. And what he does is um, he um, goes in very deep snow in the winter and um, comes upon the um, encampment of Black Kettle, a Cheyenne, quote unquote, peace chief, somebody who had been trying to negotiate with the US to come to terms that where his people could be safe. Um, and Custer sets his men um, down into the Washita River Valley. They kill dozens of people, women, children, old people, Black Kettle and his wife are killed. And Sheridan had ordered Custer to take uh, women and children captive and to use them as human shields to get out of the Washita Valley and back to safety um, at Camp Supply and then later to forts in Kansas and um, to use women and children as captives, as POWs, for uh, to force the submission of the warriors because if they hold their women and children captive, they um, will surrender. So one of the support troops for Custer after the Washita massacre in 1868 at Camp Supply is Richard Pratt. So Pratt saw that this tactic worked. If you take children captive, their parents will do what you say. Right? This is a pretty basic human truth, okay? So I'm starting to understand this captivity norm of boarding schools a lot more. Um, okay, so now we go back to Hampton. So when, after Pratt brings the Fort Marion um, POWs to Hampton, he decides, okay, this Armstrong guy is kind of a jerk. I do not agree it's gonna take generations for Indian people to sort of come into um, civilization. And I wanna create a, a school for um, Indian people called Carlisle. And they realize of course, that there are more than enough students to go around and that these students are funded usually by the federal government because of treaty terms. So um, Armstrong asks his, um, uh, you know, Armstrong had been trying for a really long time since 1870 to get Indian students. So here's a quote from him about trying to convince uh, somebody who's working for the Red Cliff Agency to allow him to have Ojibwe students at his at Hampton in 1870. So this is an idea that he was aware of for a long time. Pratt starts Carlisle. Um, Armstrong continues on with Hampton, right? And this idea of education kind of moves forward as a technology, if you will, for civilizing Indian people, right? And these kind of before and after images start to show up, right? So you can see what this photograph is called again, Francis Benjamin Johnson at Hampton, 1899 and 1900 without education, Mrs. Blacknail and child. Right, with education, ooh, look at how amazing your life could be if you go to Hampton and some of the other assimilation schools. Okay, but so where did the captivity piece kind of happen, right? So Pratt gets the okay from the army. They say, okay, we are gonna let you have a decommissioned army base in Carlisle, Pennsylvania to start um, Carlisle Indian School. 
And Pratt says, cool, I'm gonna go back to Indian territory. I'm gonna get the youth from the tribes of the uh, POWs that I had down in Fort uh, Marion in Florida, and we're gonna start our school. And Mr. Haight, the commissioner on Indian affairs said, no, 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 whoa, 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 no, you're not. We're done with them. They're on the res, we don't care about them. But we just had a huge deadly battle with the, uh, in the Dakotas where Custer was killed at the Battle of Little Bighorn. So now you must recruit your first students for Carlisle in the Dakotas because the children would be hostages for the good behavior of their people. So this quote is from Richard Pratt's autobiography. Um, and Pratt's response was, I protested that I had never met these discontented branches of the Sioux Indians, that they were then in a hostile attitude. But Mr. Haight, the commissioner, was insistent that I must go to Spotted Tail and Red Cloud because the children would be hostages for the good behavior of their people, okay? So is this really about assimilation, right? I don't think so. I think it's about a lot more than assimilation. So these are the first girls to arrive. It makes me really mad because when I, when I click on this in a different way, the, the photograph is actually really beautiful. So I apologize for that. Um, Practiced as he was ordered, right? So he went to the Dakotas with um, one of the women from Florida, recruited boys and girls to be the first students at Carlisle. He was successful in talking the chiefs into allowing him to have the, their, their children. And the logic that he used was if your children can read English and do math, that your treaties um, will be, um, have much more merit and you will understand how they have changed once they have been negotiated here in the Dakotas and they are changed once they get to Congress and then you have to live by them. And the chiefs went, mm, you got a good point, okay. These children became the symbols of nationalism. So this is the Centennial Parade um, for the Centennial of the Constitution in Philadelphia. And if you look down there, you can see that teepee um, and the uh, soldiers in blue lined up there. Those are Carlisle Indian students. So imagine um, the relief that America felt when they saw this performative uh, moment that, um, you know, Indian children were now dressed in American army um, costumes and were marching in formation to commemorate the centennial of the constitution in Philadelphia. Okay, now here's our port photograph. Um, thank you so much, Chimi Gwetch, to Dick Ford, who, um, and, and the Clements, who, um, have worked together to uh, allow this collection to come to the Clements to be digitized, more on that later. This is such an incredible resource. I looked at literally every single photograph that I could in the amount of time that I had. And I was so thrilled to find this photograph. I had been on a quest for this photo for years and had been hoping to find some proof of, of the story, this little story I'm about to tell you before my dissertation and couldn't. So what we see here is our students at Carlisle, Richard Pratt and his wife, he's nestled in there. Cheyenne parents, including you know chiefs and um, Cheyenne children. And it shows um, a, a custom that Pratt had where he would take his students to Gettysburg. He would take his students to this historic place where um, you know, the sacrifice of American soldiers and you know, blood of the nation that was spilled um, in Civil War um, and talk to them about America and nationalize these kids. And the coolest thing of all for me is that I found out that that little dude sitting at the top is the grandfather, great-grandfather of um, Gordon Yellowman, my friend, who co-curated the exhibit of Fort Marion POW drawings um, that is on exhibit right now at the Kummer Museum in Jacksonville. That's his great-grandfather up there. So it's kind of cool when Indians are allowed into spaces and to interpret our own histories and culture. Okay, I guess that's it, sorry, I thought I had one more. So hopefully you guys feel like I have, um, hold on, gotta close the poll, I'm gonna stop my share. Um, so hopefully I've given you a little bit of a, more, of a broader perspective of the work of what boarding schools are trying to do. Yes. Thank you so much. I know it's so hard to distill down the information. And it's so hard. 
And yeah, I appreciate, appreciate all your efforts. And um, I just want to remind everybody, if you have questions, to please put them in the Q&A section. And I am just going to share a couple of announcements, and then we'll get to the questions. So I um, want to tell everybody that Tomorrow, the American Historical Print Collectors Society webinar is happening, and uh, it's something co-sponsored by the Clements Library and open to the public. There are um, three wonderful speakers, and so please take uh, a look at, um, at that as a possibility. Uh, there will be a fascinating look at maritime history and historic prints, maps, and charts. Clayton Lewis will talk with experts Georgia Barnhill, James Brost, and Richard Malley. So um, everybody's welcome to uh, check that out. And then this is really an exciting thing. Uh, Veronica mentioned uh, the Richard Port Jr. collection of Native American photography. Our interns um, created a really wonderful online exhibit last year during the pandemic. And um, the Saginaw Art Museum uh, asked them to help them uh, create an in-person exhibit as well. And so if you're in the Saginaw area, you can see um, no, not even for a picture, re-examining the Native Midwest and tribes' relations to the history of photography. And of course, if you're not in Saginaw, you can still view it online, and those links for more information are in the chat. Thank you um, once again to the University of Michigan Alumni Association for sponsoring today's bookworm. Next month, we will be talking with uh, curators and staff about readings that have influenced them. So readings that have changed how they looked at a collection or at an area of study. And so this will be a really great discussion. Now, since you are already um, registered for the bookworm, you'll receive a reminder next month and you can choose to join us again once again live or if you're unable to you will still receive the, an email with the recording and resources which as I mentioned before you'll receive later today. So um, I think that's all of my announcements. Uh, oh, except of course, if you'd like to sponsor a future episode of The Bookworm, please let uh, myself or Anne know. And we really appreciate everyone's participation in this program and um, appreciate everyone who also funds the work that we do at the Clemens Library. Okay. I see lots of questions coming in. So we'll take a look. And so um, I think this is an important one that Tom Wagner is asking. Um, he wants to know why the children would be murdered. Yeah, right, me too. <laughs> I do, before I start to say that, I just wanted to say, I quickly looked at the chat at, um, while, while Ann was giving the, or while Angela was giving the announcements. And I just want to say miigwech to the um, Native people who were on this chat and on this talk who shared about their the experiences of their family. And um, I really, really encourage people to um, seek the student files of their families and um, just miigwech for sharing, you know, that hard story, the hard stories. And uh, I hope that this isn't triggering for you. So, um, so why kill children, right? This is... <laughs> I mean, this is the question, right? This is the question. I, the way that I have come, one of the ways that I have come to think about it, and I, I, I don't know is the honest answer. I can't imagine why, but it, this question must be asked. 
And in trying to understand that question, I feel like that's one of the reasons why Sheridan's total war tactics in, um, you know, in Indian territory and in other places when they enacted murder to um, bring us into submission by any means necessary, it's tied to earlier deadly campaigns such as smallpox blankets, which happened to my tribe during the British colonial era um, in Michigan. And, um, you know, where they knowingly, um, you know, colonial agents knowingly circulated uh, blankets infected with smallpox from smallpox wards to tribes that would not make treaties. So, okay, you're not going to let us have your land by treaty. Um, we'll just wipe you out. So it's genocide. It's genocide. And when you have captives, right, when you, when you understand these children as prisoners of war, as captives of the state, it also helps me understand things like mass incarceration. You know, um, I was in Oklahoma City for the past seven years. I'm looking at the Julius Jones case. Um, I mean, we could go on and on, you know, um, to police brutality. So these are things that have existed since the beginning of our country. And they're things that we really need to take a hard look at and, and, and be courageous in that looking. Thank you. Um, oh, Tom's also asking, would the boarding schools mix Native American children from different tribes? Yes, and so they, they absolutely would. So one of the really interesting things about boarding school also, and this has been talked about quite a bit in the historiography, is that some, some students and communities viewed this as a positive, right? We didn't view ourselves as, as race, racial, we viewed ourselves as cultural. So back in this era, I would have said, I'm Ojibwe or I'm Anishinaabe. Right, I wouldn't say I'm Indian. What does that even mean? Race is an invention anyway, right? So um, this the settlers brought this idea of race, right? And I would look at it, my historic enemy, an Iroquois person or a Lakota person and not in any way think that they were the same as me, just like in Europe would, would German people and French people and whatever say, I'm white first. No, they would say I'm German, I'm French. And in fact, you know, we're at war with those other white people. So, <clears throat> so it was, it was a racializing tactic and like all racializing tactics, it was um, used for the benefit of the people who, um, who had power, but it also created a lot of intertribal um, relationships and activism that still exists to this day. So we do um, you know, get together around um, our identity as Indigenous people and help to uh, create change in things like federal policy. Thank you. Um, Jason is wondering if you've had the opportunity to look at the writings of Jedediah Morse um, at the Clements Library. No, tell me. Uh, he writes about his uh, he writes a lot about educating Native children in Northern Michigan in his government reports in the 1820s. I need this for an exhibit I'm working on. Thank you so much. I'm gonna, will you put something in the chat so I can copy it? I'm so happy to know about that. We're doing, yeah. I'm, I'm working on an exhibit with the Grand Traverse Band. I've been doing a lot of curator work, curatorial work um, um, over the last year co during COVID especially. So. Um, I'm very glad to know about that. We're trying to look at early Indian education for an exhibit at the Yowing uh, Museum, uh, the Tribal Museum for the Grand Traverse Band. So we got yes. that tip. That's awesome. Um, so there's a, a couple of questions. I wasn't paying attention when we were talking before the program really yeah. got started. A couple of questions about the language um, things that we were talking about. And so Frida is talking about, um, she went to a webinar last night with the Coast Salish tribes and I'm finished was a common phrase. And so she's wondering. Unfinished. I'm finished. Oh, I'm finished. I'm finished. I don't know about that part. I don't yeah. know about that part, but I have to tell you guys that if you're curious about um, a tribal language, any tribal language, uh, first of all, I cannot emphasize this strongly enough. A language is a worldview. 
and one of the one of the surest ways to get injured um, and to have violence enacted against you, often deadly violence enacted against you at a federal Indian boarding school is to get caught speaking your language. Those kids did amazing things, took amazing risks, knowing that they could be beaten or killed. And I have eyewitness accounts of children being killed at Mount Pleasant Indian School for speaking their language. So why? There's what, what is so darn scary about speaking your language that you as an adult would would beat a child to death, right? It must have power. So tribal communities, there's, there's um, indigenous language revitalization happening across the continent. So, and often there's programming that's available for free on Zoom or on Facebook. So um, if you're interested in that, like go and, and, and be there with people and um, just listen humbly, quietly, like I do, and just try to absorb what, all that's embedded in the language, all, all of the teachings of, of language. Thank you. Uh, so the, the next one is related to that as well, um, because Bonnie is just wondering if you could say a little bit more about what you were saying about um, spiritual things and, and um, you know, the, the, the non-spiritual Yes, so in the Anishinaabe and in the uh, um, language community, um, and Anishinaabe is the language of this place, of the Great Lakes, right? It's the Ojibwe or Chippewa, Odawa or Ottawa, and the Bodewatomi or Potawatomi. This is our language. Um, the Potawatomi will tell you that they have their own language. Um, I'm just giving a shout out to my Potawatomi cousins. Um, I wanna make sure I respect their view, but, um, one of the things that we talk about a lot and one of the ways that Anishinaabe when our language is organized is, um, like I said, not so concerned with uh, gender and this binary idea of gender. I mean, we don't, we're an ancient culture. I mean, we're millennia old. We're like, oh, this binary gender thing is like ridiculous. We don't even have a word for it, it's so dumb, right? But instead we do, there's no he, she in our language, right? So, but we do concern ourselves a lot with Rather or not, something is that's being talked about is of spirit, spiritually animate, or spiritually inanimate, or a thing. So, you there are entire verb sets that verbs that are only used when you're discussing something that is spiritually animate, and the exact same action with a completely different word for something that is spiritually inanimate. So like Angela and I were talking about that if you are eating, um, if you, to say, you know, I'm eating candy, the word for eat is one word. If you say I'm eating fish, that word they would use for eat for something that is of spirit. So all animals are of spirit. That word would be totally different. And the reason that that, what that signals to me is that our worldview is much more concerned with with spirit as a whole, and also, um, you know, to the point where we develop uh, distinct word sets for those things, and then also that we do not view the world as as a collection of inanimate objects and things, right? That we are in tune with the fact that animals have spirit, and there's a spirit of trees and water and, and creation and rocks and many many things that are that are of spirit and, and we're in touch with that and I love that. Thank you. That was a really long answer. Sorry. I'm kind of a language nerd and I don't know very much. So I, I talk a lot about it. That that is that is good. Okay. Um let's see. So Patricia's uh she's saying you mentioned Red Cloud and discussed the warriors who turned themselves in and were sent to Florida. Was this part of the Mankato massacre event and the Trail of Tears? So yes and no, right? Are these, uh, um, they, they are part of a federally driven um, genocidal, um, illegal, dispossession of indigenous people from our lands. These are all great examples. And to get the land by any means necessary. 
right? No matter what the laws say, no matter what your religion says, no matter what, what would Jesus do, all of those things are ignored. Um, and horrible, horrible things were done to indigenous people in this country um, so that your American settlers could have access to our lands and our resources, including the Trail of Tears, including the Mankato mass hangings, including the establishment of schools that would kill a child for speaking the language of their home. So in that way they're connected, yes, but are these people directly descended from the people who had those things you mentioned and acted upon them? Not that I know of. So I hope that was the right kind of answer. Okay. Right. Let me know if, if it isn't. Um, what is the relationship of the 1823 uh, mission school on Mackinac Island? Yeah, so this is an early um, mission school. It's one of the schools that I'm trying to learn more about in, uh, for this exhibition that I'm talking about and the work that um, I'm doing in collaboration with um, uh, my peer, uh, Sammy McClellan Dial, who's the TIPO officer at Grand Traverse Band. So that mission school, if you read Cleland, like Brights of Conquest, right? Charles Cleland is a great person to read about for this. And we're um, looking heavily at his work. But um, that school um, was an early missionary school. So this is another way that I feel like we can't speak about the schools in this monolithic way. So the Mackinac Island School, right? Which, which parents voluntarily sent their kids to, or they did it under pressure from missionaries who had influence on them, right? Is one dynamic, right? Then, but when you get to Carlisle and Mount Pleasant School, um, 70 years later, there is, there uh, was not a, re well, the, those schools were not created by or run by churches and, and their work was a little bit different, right? So, it's different when you have these early missionary schools that are on or near Indian communities and Indian parents largely choose to send their children and the children can come home in the summer or they can come home at the end of the day, right? That's one kind of an experience and that's different from a federal school where in the case of my family, you parents lose all parental rights, you kidnap the children, you send them away. By the way, you don't ever see the children until they're done with school. So parents would send their kids, did not realize that they weren't allowed to see or have contact with their child for five years. If you think about my great grandma, Daisy, she went when she was 11, right? And she couldn't be seen again by her parents until she was 16 years old. Think about all that happens with a child from that age of five, to, uh, 11 to 16. So very, very different, tons of diversity around the sorts of schools and, and regionally what uh, was going on in each region. So very complex, but a cool question. Thank you for that, miigwech. Um, Rebecca wants to know if you mentioned an exhibit in Jacksonville, Florida. Yes, so that was, it's, it's still up. Um, it's at the Kummer Museum of Art and it is um, showing the drawings, the ledger drawings, ledger drawings of um, the Fort Marion POWs specifically the Cheyenne prisoners. And I um, co-curated that show with Gordon Yellowman of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribe and Eric Shingleton, the, um, Eric Singleton, the um, curator at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum, which owns a large collection of drawings from the Fort Marion POWs. Check it out, it's on their website, Cummer, C-U-M-M-E-R. Um. And can you get, can I just say, can you believe that there are like, honestly, like two dozen books just like this on these drawings by art historians. This one is by um, a really wonderful scholar named Joyce Sabo, who's a renowned scholar of ledger drawing. She was at University of New Mexico to, and, and this collection that she wrote on the, uh, the collection at the um, Cowboy Museum to get from Santa Fe or Albuquerque to Oklahoma City, you have to go through the Cheyenne and Arapaho Reservation to get to Oklahoma City. And if you drive another 40 minutes, you can get to the Kiowa Reservation and the Comanche Reservation. And it, it, I don't understand why art historians don't include and center and foreground and highlight the, the interpretations of 
the native people who still have these warrior societies, who still make blankets in that way and beadwork in that way, et cetera, they have a lot to say about what these drawings really depict and the language, the visual language in these drawings. So we tried to do some of that in the Comer um, exhibit. And I just, it's, it's so dumb to leave people out of the interpretation of their own cultures and histories. It just, it's, it, it, it impoverishes your work as a scholar. The, the book that you were holding up, is that, is that from the exhibit or from? Uh, no, we didn't get a catalog actually, but okay. um, the art, uh, art from Fort Marion. And actually there's a picture on the back of the POWs all uh, at the fort kind of lined up upstairs. Oh, wow. The National Park Service is working right now, with, which uh, the National Park Service owns the fort now, and they're working with the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribe and other um, tribes in Oklahoma who are present there um, to have interpretive kiosks now. So um, they're do, right. they've done some oral histories and really wonderful work within the community so that they have things to share um, in that way. So Tom is asking, did the Native Americans that donated land to the University of Michigan expect to benefit from that transfer? Yes, thank you, Tom. Okay, so here's what I wanna know. Okay, I gotta tell you guys, Angela and Ann know this about me. Okay, you guys, why is there no commemoration of the creation story of the University of Michigan? Why? On the diag, is there not a memorial or whatever, indigenous garden or something that commemorates the land gift that was um, given to create a school that became the University of Michigan? Why? We have been bugging the University of Michigan and the state of Michigan for this since the 70s. It, it, it drives me absolutely insane that it is not there. And so, yes, what the Treaty of Fort Meigs, it's, that's another way that it's referred to, of what that land gift was about is the tribes who were from Detroit actually, gave a really, um, a, a nice parcel of land in a highly strategic, valuable place to create a school where um, indigenous kids and settler kids would be educated together in this very French model, right? This is at St. Anne's Church and it's this, you know, this heavy French presence during the fur trade has continued forward into 1817. That land, the school failed, it was not funded. The feds were like all about it when the land gift was happening. And then when it came time to fund the school, we're like, no, forget it. So that parcel of land was sold a parcel of land was bought in Ann Arbor and University of Michigan was started, right? So when we talk about land acknowledgements, right? Or land back or diversity, equity, and inclusion. If we had like, a, like honestly, something that would take up, you know, the amount of space of my dining room table and, and, a, and, a, and a commemoration, imagine, right? Think to yourself, did I ever know that this is the creation story of Michigan? No, huh? And think to yourself, like, why is that? Did you hear about it at the bicentennial of the University of Michigan? Was that something that was really emphasized? If not, like, why? Why? Okay, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Thanks for asking that question so I could have a rant about that. Because it just, it just, just galls me. <laughs> oh, lots of questions. And I, I hope that, that people are realizing that that's, um, you know, that's one of the things that we all need to keep doing and that that's what uncovers history, makes us, you know, more well-rounded people is to ask a lot of questions. Yes. That's why I like to say yes to, to opportunities like this. Yes. This is a chance Thank to talk you. to each other. Yeah. All right, so let's see. Um, Christopher is wondering, what are some ways you could envision educating the public um, outside of the academy on your findings? 
um, outside of monographs and articles? What are some ways that historians can communicate this to other interested people? Right, I thank you for that question, Christopher. This is really the consuming thought of my life right now. Um, uh, this is kind of painful to say, but um, you know, I there were really wonderful people in my program, really wonderful faculty in my program who did incredibly brilliant work. Um, but I was not, I often had the impression when I was a student at Michigan that there was not a true investment in and valuing of um, connection with um, Native communities. So um, there was, there's beautiful archival engagement, you know, with scholars at Michigan, incredible work, incredible work uh, out of uh, amazing, amazing, valuable archives like those at the Clements, right? But the kind of work that I um, am interested in uh, really puts Native communities in the center. And um, I wasn't really sure what to do with my work by the time I was done at Michigan. And I wasn't at all confident that the Academy cared about the same things that I did. So I kind of went back to being a reporter after all that kind of work and time and expense of, of getting a PhD. So I um, definitely knew that my first choice was to, if I was gonna turn my dissertation into a book, I would want it to be off from a commercial press in, um, in language that, that you know, everyday Indian people could understand and engage with, not really in that beautifully rich and dense language of academia that I love, but um, so hopefully I'm gonna get a book deal, I hope, and definitely um, encourage people to read. Um, I think that there's a link on there to the um, National Native American Boarding School Healing Project and their list of recommended readings. Um, and I particularly recommend two books. One is called War Dance at Fort Marion, which gives the context of this piece from Indian Territory really well. Red Looking Bill did an amazing job. And then um, Education for Extinction is an older book by David Wallace Adams. And he gives a great policy overview and also has some stories from children. But um, most of all, I, um, I really think that most of the oral histories, um, students telling their own stories, I think those are the most important. Um, it's certainly much more complete than the archive. I've been in all the archives that, uh, I've been in archives across the country and um, they, they hide a lot more than they tell when it comes to this topic. So um, mainstream media and oral histories from survivors. So a simple Google search is, uh, will produce riches for you know, your, your curriculum for sure. All right, Charles is wondering if there's any information about Native girls becoming impregnated while in the schools. Oh yeah, it was rampant. Mm -hmm. There are stories that I, uh, that are very common that I uh, would not repeat in this setting, but I would certainly repeat in a talking circle with, um, you know, traditional medicines smudging around um, about the experiences of, of, our, of our girls in the schools and um, impregnated by teachers and priests and, um, you know, molested by nuns. And yes, there was a lot of that. And, and the fate of those babies um, was, um, you, don't, you don't know what's gonna to happen to those babies right after they're born. They were often, they often disappeared. Let's just put it that way. But the, the things that those students saw um, was uh, very, very traumatic and criminal. So one of the outcomes I'm hoping, I'm hoping for with this um, Department of Interior Boarding School Truth Initiative is that we, um, take a, you know, learn from the, the work of the survivors of clergy abuse in Catholic schools that, um, that the, the abuses of, of clergy were viewed as being sins that should be handled within the church. And they weren't, they were crimes. They were crimes. They were high crimes. 
And I want the, and it was one of the things I said during my consultation this week with um, Secretary Holland and others on our um, listening sessions, that um, I hope that one of the outcomes of this work is that they will activate the Department of Just Justice um, to criminally prosecute um, in the broadest sense possible. Thank you. Um, so Tim is asking, he said, sorry, this question isn't necessarily related to boarding schools. However, is there an initiative to rename certain areas in what is now called Michigan to what they were called before colonization? I wish, what a cool thing it would be if we, if we did that. So I have heard that, this, that there are discussions about this in the State Historical Society. That is just something that I was told. I have not asked them yet. But I can tell you that um, tribes are doing a really cool job of um, you know, doing signage and um, renaming or restoring names. Um, so for example, I don't know if any of you guys go up to Petoskey Harbor Springs and up the Tunnel of Trees to, to the bridge, but um, the Little Traverse Bay Band has done some really beautiful signage in Anishinaabe Muin um, and telling the stories of place. Uh, so that's one great example that comes to mind for me. And I just absolutely love it when they do that. There are a couple of maps too that, um, oh geez, it's in my closet. I'm not gonna run and go get it. But um, there is a bookstore in Petoskey called McLean and Aiken. I'll put it in the chat. And they sell an Anishinaabe Moon map of the tip of the mitt. That's really wonderful, so. Oh, nice. Yeah, those are some resources. Thank you. What was Tim yes. about that? Say what Tim said until I can put this in here um, in the chat. So in case anybody wants the map. Um, yes, and the other, do you want me to read it again? Oh, sorry. Um, initiative to rename certain areas in what is now called Michigan to what they were called before colonization. And so Tim, one of the things that, that we were talking about before the program completely started is how many names in Michigan are derived um, from uh, indigenous place names. And so that's another thing to take a look at as well as, um, you know, some of the some of the words that you might not realize uh, are indeed. Yeah, and if you look at place, I'm so sorry, I thought, I'm sorry, Angela, I didn't, I wasn't trying to get you to be repetitive. I was thinking that uh, something popped up that Tim said something else. But, sure. um, but yeah, I mean, when you think about place, right, there's really lovely scholarship in American studies, for sure, and in other places about placemaking, right? I mean, Believe it or not, I've always been a lifelong fan of the University of Michigan. Like I'm all about it. And my friend, Jim Herbo is now the football coach and we were buddies in South Quad because he never had quarters for the laundry machines. I just need you guys to know that, okay? That's a little truth telling. And my current boyfriend was his backup quarterback. So there you go. I'm living, oh. I'm living the MGO Blue Dream every day. So, um, uh, <laughs> It, you know, it's, I think of University of Michigan like our child, you know, University of Michigan is the, is, is the child of the tribes in, in Michigan. So um, when it comes to placemaking at, at U of M and so many amazing and powerful and, you know, troubling and transformative things have happened at Michigan in its relationship with tribes. So like these things matter. And the reason that we humans name places is to keep those stories going. So I think that's such an important thing. And I encourage you guys to support it every chance you get whenever you're out in your own life. So yeah, thanks. I don't mean to ramble on about that, but I, that's kind of a topic that's close to my heart. No, that's a good one. Um, Tom's wondering if it's true that there are more Native Americans in Michigan today than 200 years ago. Oh, I never heard that. I so the, the important thing to note, I think, is more than sort of, I mean, obviously we're less than 1%, right? So if we look at, you kind of can't 
put, you know, 1820s dollars into today's dollars, right? And the same thing with population. So like, of course we were the majority of population and now we're less than 1%. Um, um, and it's been really nice to see how tribes have um, used uh, casino revenues and other sources, you know, grant so, uh, resources to try to restore languages through language programs, tribal museums, tribal cultural programs, behavioral health. I mean, tribes are working hard. They are churning with programs to, um, to restore the things um, that, that were taken or lost along the way. So that's what your question makes me think about. Mm -hmm. um, Elizabeth is wondering if there were any schools where the children were treated kindly. Yeah, oh, what a great question. Thank you for asking that. So, um, so I, there are definitely schools. So one school that comes to mind to me right away is um, a little school north of Harbor Springs called Five Mile Creek. And if you are a Harbor Springs person, um, it's just north of Pond Hill Farm. It adjoins Pond Hill Farm, this great um, farmer's market and restaurant. And I, you know, the day schools were definitely schools that had such a better reputation because they were just like, uh, you know, rural schools everywhere. You know, your mom got you up in the morning, you ate your little breakfast, you took, you know, your little satchel, you went to school, you came home, walked home with your friends, um, you know, and, and being a, a rural school teacher for any population of children was pretty thankless work. So often the teachers, you know, were very just dedicated and loving. So the day school model definitely has um, a, a much better, um, uh, much better memories. So thanks for that question. It gave us an opportunity to say that. Um, Elizabeth is also wondering what happened to the children when they aged out of the schools. Right. So this is also interesting. <clears throat> so Walter, who you saw, his little brother was two when his mother died. He isn't in the picture, I think, probably because he couldn't have, you know, kind of held still long enough for the photograph to, to work. Um, so Al, his, his name was Alex. And they took Alex, who, you know, at the age of two, uh, two or three, he, you know, two and a half, uh, when his mom died. And they, instead of letting him stay with his father, they made him go to another family near Mount Pleasant until he was about four. And then they, you know, shipped him over to the school. Alex, um, and this is a great thing about these student files, you guys, I'm telling you for survivors uh, and descendants out there, the, your student files can often hold treasures. So in our family file, what I learned is that when Alex was 18, he had run away to Grand Rapids. This was in, um, he was at Mount Pleasant. This was in 1918. World War I is going. He could have easily been drafted or I don't know if they did a draft for World War I, but he could have easily enlisted to go fight in World War I. But instead, according to the school, he was a fifth grader. And every time that you ran away, um, you got another year. Um, so it became basically like, you know, a juvenile detention home. So um, the schools were, and, and at a later point by the twenties, basically you, you could age out. And a lot of times kids were 14 years old, they got up to seventh grade and they went home and there were no high schools often for um, Indian kids because of segregated education in Michigan. So they would leave. So again, it depends on the era, right? And it depends on the school. So some schools, yes. Some schools, it depends on the era. So a really cool question. But again, it's like, you can see why it took me 10 years to get this done in grad school, right? It just, it, it's morphing and changing so much over time, depending on what's going on in the country and who's in charge of federal Indian policy. Right. Um, let's see. Now um, we have a variety of comments, it looks like. Yeah. I'm kind of looking at them too. Um, Pamela's talking about a footnote about Samuel Chap Chapman Armstrong. He was married at the Pinehurst camp on Squam Lake, New Hampshire. Hmm. Hmm. He 
He was at, um, he went to Williams College. So I wonder if that's why. Interesting. Yeah. All right. And then it looks like Tim put something in about the, um, the plaque. I, didn't, I can't see that. Will you tell me what it says? Oh, it's from 2002. Um, so that might have even been, were you still here in 2002? Yes, that's when I started actually. Okay, so, yeah. So you're talking about that little dinky plaque that's like this big with like eight point font on it that was screwed to the side of the MLB. Is that the one you're talking about? Because that's where it was when I was at Michigan. And then they did renovations to the MLB and they took the plaque down. And then I didn't ever see it go back up again. And if you wanted to actually read what was on the plaque, you had to walk into a bush do for, my, for me anyway, to get close enough to be able to read what it said. <laughs> it was ridiculous. We need a plaque, come on. I don't even want a plaque. I want <laughs> like something that you look at when you go across the dike, darn it. All right, well, that, that adds to the story, right? Um, and so Bill is saying that he was late to the webinar and he's teaching at the high school level and he's amazed how little students know about the Indian boarding school reality. Um, he wanted to ask, what is the one thing you would say to young people to move the conversation forward? Um, That's a great question. So I have to tell you, that's, that's something that I'm really, I, I don't really know. I don't know right now. You know, we are so, um, we are so in a fast moving river right now with this issue, with the boarding school truth initiative, with the discovery of, you know, thousands of, of children, um, deceased children in unmarked graves, um, museums are transforming. Universities are, are trying to transform, you know, some are doing it more quickly than others or with more sincerity than others. And um, I, I really, I really, I don't know right now, but I'll tell you, I am trying with everything I have to figure it out. And that's part of what I'm excited about for this exhibit that we're working on at Yowing Museum at Grand Traverse Band in, um, near Sutton's Bay in Peshawbi town, because we're trying to figure out that very question for tribal kids of the you know Grand Traverse Band community and other communities that we'll visit. So I do know that the way that we're talking about it now is helpful, but not, not nearly enough. Thanks. I, um... James Harper has, has an interesting question. He says, I served as a Marine grunt in Vietnam. Among my comrades was an Oklahoma Native American. He said he enlisted in the Marines because they were the elite American society. So he wants to know how did the schools handle the warrior ethic and spirit? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting component of, of, um, of federal Indian boarding schools. Um, if you grow up where when you wake up in the you wake up in the morning to a whistle, you stand next to your bed. You wait for the whistle to go brush your teeth. You wait for the whistle to walk down to breakfast in in uniform as a as a military unit, military style unit, right? You stand it at your chair, your assigned chair, until the whistle, and you get to sit down. Then you have to wait for the whistle to start to eat, etc. Throughout your entire day, right? That you're really well prepared for military service for sure. And a lot of, um, a lot of Indian um, youth went into the military um, and they, you know, they're, they're used to marching around in uniforms for sure in, in these other regiments. So I think that's definitely a part of it too. What I hear the most commonly from um, things that I read and, and people in my own family who served, including in the Marines, is that they felt that they were protecting, and, and I'm sure many still do, feel that they are protecting their homelands. You know, that our connection to our homelands is really primary. Um, 
over any uh, political system or, or nation. So um, we raise our children as best we can to, to maintain that connection to place and to homeland. And so that's what I've heard most commonly. So do you think then when somebody was raised in a warrior society and went to the schools, I mean, what, when you're describing this, this, the whistles and things, how, how would that, how would they have responded to that? And what did the schools, did, were the schools trying to use that, um, you know, did they, did they find a way to use or subdue that? that feeling that, that the students might have had from their own tribes or do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I do. I mean, so definitely a per one of the purposes of the school was to make primary an allegiance and an obedience to the nation um, over tribe, right? And over family that was explicitly discussed. So I think that you, that you bring a really good point up there, Angela. Um, I think also that it's probably worth asking, why does the military dress people in unison, shave their hair, march them around, um, you know, salute, demand obedience to, to the hierarchies of power, right? These are useful behaviors, right? They have a purpose. They have a purpose. And those um, protocols, norms were um, deployed by former soldiers at the schools. Right. Well, it's already 1130. So, right. and thank you so much to everybody who's asked such great questions and shared so many things in the chat. I will um, send you later, Veronica, a, a file of the chat because I know I haven't mm. been able to keep up on it. And um, it's, it's, wonderful to see what things everyone's sharing. Thank you so much for all of this good information and food for thought. And, yeah. and she miigwech to everybody who shared. I'm trying my best to like watch the chat go by too. And I appreciate people, especially asking hard questions and also for people who are sharing stories from their own, own families and communities. So, so miigwech. And this is, this is how change happens. You guys is through talking to each other and asking these questions and putting our heads together. So let's, let's keep doing that. Exactly. Well, I appreciate you so much and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Miigwech. Miigwech. Mama Pika Wadman.